We need a bell. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship with us this morning. There's a bit of a buzz around today. There's some guests with us because of some birthday parties and there's beautiful weather and it's all, it's, it's a great morning to be worshipping together here in Dolby and for those who are joining us on our live stream. Of course, the thing that we're happiest about is that we're in this season of Easter and we're celebrating the new life of Jesus. But as we're going to hear more than just that, the new life which is ours and that's really important for us. So let's begin our worship together in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing our first two songs, Hallelujah for the Cross, and He Knows My Name.
gracious God, we know, we know love because we made, you made it eternally visible in the person of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He revealed the depth of that love by laying down his life for us. Jesus showed us that love was not confined to words alone, nor was it ever an abstract quality, but was at all times a heart-centred activity. Stir such a love in our hearts so that we, all we do may be pleasing to you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue with our confession and absolution. So friends, let us tell God our sins. Tell him we are sorry and ask him to forgive us because of Jesus. We know that we are born sinful and can't do anything about it ourselves. We have sinned against you by what we have thought, said and done and by the good things that we have left undone. We have not loved you or our neighbour as we should. What we deserve is punishment now and forever. But we plead for your mercy and grace for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Do not dwell on your wounds any longer for Christ has risen to heal you. He has risen to forgive you. He has risen to change us all and to bind us together in God's love now and into eternity. So as a called and ordained servant of the word, by the command of Jesus and on his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. Amen. We'll hear our readings for today from God's word. The first reading for today is written in Acts chapter 3, verses 12 to 19. After healing a lame beggar at the temple gate, Peter said to the people gathered there, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is written in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel reading. The Gospel is written in Luke chapter 24, verse 36b to 48. Jesus himself stood among his disciples and said to them, 
peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. I'm going to ask you to please be seated. We're going to have our time for kids. And just for those who are with us who have the children they'd like to bring uh, to have come up as well, just letting you know that uh, we do live stream. So there is a possibility that the children's faces will be seen over the internet. So if that is a problem for you, uh, they don't have to come up. But they get to hear from Megan today. And I mean, I might sit here. It's, um, it's, it's going to be great. So please come and join us. Testing. Oh, I'm on. Hey, how are we this morning? Oh, yeah. Really good? Okay. All right. So who can tell me what you need to do to be healthy, to have a healthy body? Yep. Eat healthy food. You eat all your veggies, right? Yep. What else? Exercise. That's a great one. Other ones? Work out at the gym. You go to the gym, yeah? Work out, exercise, eat healthy food, maybe spending time outdoors. What else do we need to do? Grain. Eat grain. Eat all the healthy, all the right food groups. And, you know, we get lots of lessons at school, don't we, about eating healthy and what to do, and we can read books about how to be healthy and how to eat healthy. But sometimes, no matter how hard we try, we still get sick, Right? Yeah, and what do you have to do when you get sick? Any ideas? Stay home. Do you have to go and see anyone or, yeah? Stay in bed and rest or you might have to see a doctor. And sometimes we don't like going to the doctor, do we? Because the doctor might tell us something we don't want to hear. That happens sometimes. And they might even tell us that we need to have a test or they might tell us that we need to have some medicine. Ooh. We have to take medicine sometimes, don't we? But we know that we need to take the medicine because that will make our body well again. So do you know that loving God can be a little bit like that? We've got all the instructions that we need to do, all the right things so that we can love God. But no matter how hard we try, sometimes this thing called... Can anyone read that word? Sin, it gets in the way, doesn't it? Sometimes sin gets in the way between us and God. And even though we know all the right things to do, sometimes we still, that sin still gets in the way. Sin's a little bit hard to explain, isn't it? But the way I think about it is anything that we're thinking about or feeling or that we say that gets in between us and loving God. So we can't just get in the car and go to God to find out how we get fixed, can we? Like we can't jump in the car and we go, we jump in the car with mum and dad or our carers, grandparents and go to the doctor. Can't do that to go and check in with God and find out how we get rid of this sin. So what, what are some of the things we could do instead? Any ideas? Yeah. You can get, yeah, you can get a shot. And if we're thinking about um, between us and God, some of those shots might be things like if we say a prayer 
or if we come to church or kids' time, what other things could we do to help us get closer to God? Hmm, tricky. Go to church, that's a good one. We can sing songs. We've been singing songs this morning. But even when we do all of those things, and I've just got to grab my little bag because I left it over here. Even when we do all of those things, sometimes it's still really hard to get rid of the sin, isn't it? Cameron, do you want to have a go at see if you can wipe off the sin for me on there? Just give it a wipe on those words and see. Oh, trying really hard, aren't you? Do you want to try a little bit harder? Oh, it's just really... Oh, I, thank you, Cameron, for trying. I really appreciate it. you want to have a go too? Yeah, no. So we try. Thank you very much. It's really tricky, isn't it? Oh... Do you know what, though? So even though we know all the things that we need to do, sometimes we can't do it just by ourselves. And in the little story that um, Mrs. Pecullis just read out, we learn about how Jesus died and then he rose again. And in that story, he went and met with his mates, his disciples, and they had a sit around and they were talking they were eating fish together and they could not believe they'd seen him die so they could not believe he was alive and he told them an amazing story he shared with them about how God had there was sin in the world and God had sent a very very special bit of medicine to fix up that sin any idea what that medicine might be I'm gonna say it nice and loud Jesus Jesus, Jesus was the medicine that God sent And that medicine, when we do all of those things and we get close to God, we learn a lot more about how amazing Jesus is and the medicine that he is. And when God sent Jesus, he could wipe all of our sin away, all the sin in the world. So that's a pretty amazing story, isn't it? Yeah? Yeah? So we need to remember that when we have, you know, thoughts and actions and things that are making us forget about God or keeping us away from God, we can remember that miracle of Jesus rising from the dead for us because he's our rescuer. He's like our medicine and he is our way and our truth and our life. And I'm just going to ask Erin if she would mind just reading a little prayer for us before we go back to our seats. Thank you, Erin. Dear God, sometimes sin can take us away from you. Thank you for sending Jesus to be the amazing medicine to save us from sin. Help us to always remember Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I ask you all to stand as we confess the faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for the sermon today is, well, it's based on a little phrase in the Gospel lesson and then we go back and have a look at the first reading as well. I'll explain it as we go, so let's pray. Lord, as our theme today is open our minds, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit who works to open our mind to the truths of the faith, who points us to Jesus, who helps us to understand and believe, that we too might, might have our minds opened to how you work in your word and in the world. Amen. Please be seated. So I need to take you on a little thought journey so you know where this is all coming from this week. Um, we have a, a minister's fraternal in Dolby where we meet with the ministers of every denomination and it was our turn to host it. And so I had to do the devotion. And I don't know, I'm comfortable writing sermons, but devotion's always a bit hard. A short devotion, maybe it's keeping it short that's the problem for me, I don't know. But I looked at the LCA devotion that comes out every day. You can get them emailed to you if anyone wants to know. And it spoke about things that as a Lutheran, I went, oh yeah, cool, All right, that makes sense. And then I went, oh, how would you hear that if you didn't come from our tradition? It spoke about something that we have grown up with from earliest days, I'm sure. It spoke about law and gospel. Law and gospel. We know that, pretty easy. Then I went, okay, every church, I'm sure, uses those words. But I think some of them might use them a bit differently. And so I tried to explain Of course, I had to start with the, pre the, the, the preface here. We stand under God's Word. We don't tell Him what to do or how He should do it. But as students of the Word, we've looked back, Lutherans have looked back and seen what God has chosen to do and how He's seen fit for His Word to work in people's hearts and minds. And this is the open your minds bit that struck me from the Gospel lesson and we've seen that God's good and perfect will, Word functions in two very specific ways. Again, another disclaimer. Often we forget and we talk about like you know, law, bad, gospel, good, you know, but it doesn't work that way. It's all God's Word. It's all God's good and perfect Word. But it functions in two very specific ways. We distinguish between the work of the law and the work of the gospel. We see God's Word doing two very different things depending on where we're at in our life but as part of the same process. Now the Gospel lesson for today as well as the one for last week which was, um, I was on holidays, but I believe was about Jesus and the two disciples on the road to Emmaus or as mentioned in there somewhere, usually is, mentions in each of these, these readings about how Jesus opened the minds of the disciples through an explanation of the Scriptures, or so they could understand the Scriptures. Wasn't it the catchphrase of psychic festivals and everything for years, open your minds, like it's some wonderful thing that we should look forward to. To me, what they're describing is brain surgery. And that's not without risk. For us to have our minds opened to the truth of Scripture can be radical surgery. It can be changing of what we think of ourselves and the world around us. But once we see it, you can't go back. You can't see the world or ourselves in any other way. Now, we talk in the church all the time, and rightly, about sharing the gospel. I mean, this is the Evangelical Lutheran Church, right? Which means, evangelical means good news. The church of the good news, the gospel. And we try to let people know of the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. But that's not always where we have to start. Megan mentioned this morning the idea of medicine for the sicknesses we have. I could come to you and say that I've found a cure for cancer and I need you to take it and you would look at me and go, but I don't have cancer. I don't need it. And sometimes it can be the same with the gospel. You need, we have a saviour, 
Oh, I don't need a saviour, I'm fine. Okay, then you need to hear the law. Law and gospel. I love Peter's speech in our first lesson for today. I mean, have a listen to this. Was this, was this the accusation of the law driving us to know that we need a saviour? Or was this the beautiful message of good news? Listen to these words. You handed him over to be killed. And you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. Good news? This is all, this is the law at work. Peter starts in exactly the right place. After all, as I said, what use is proclaiming the forgiveness of sins to people who don't believe that they have sins that need to be forgiven? And I'm sure we've all come across them. Oh, you know, I'm, I live a good life. I try and do more good than bad. I'm fine. I don't need Jesus. I'll be, I'll be right. And then we very gently need to apply the law. And I use that word gently quite intentionally. In this first lesson, Peter was calling them to repent. That's where he came to. But they needed to know why they needed to repent. And then he could go on to share the gospel of sins forgiven because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, one of the ways we know the law works is to accuse us, to convict us of sin. Have you ever had that moment where you realize you've done the wrong thing and something in your heart just goes, oh no, I'm the one at fault here. How much do you love the people that point that out to you? It's rare, isn't it? To have your sin pointed out to you, your fault pointed out to you and be thankful to the person who does it? As I spoke about in our pastor's fraternal meeting, applying God's law is one of the least enjoyable roles to which a pastor is called. But it is still very important. And it's not just pastors, it's any of us. In a world that has become more and more tolerant and accepting, that word sin that Megan wrote on the board there, some people might not have seen that word before. It's become very unpopular, the idea of sin. And whenever we try to gently let someone know that what they're doing might be against God's will for them or that it's potentially harmful to others, you often get that question, who are you to judge me? Heard any, anything like that before? Who are you to judge me? And this is a really important point because it's a good question. It is. It's a very good question. And it's on this point that so many Christians have gone wrong. When someone asks you that question, who are you to judge me? The correct answer is no one. I am nobody to judge you. I have no right to judge you or anyone. But then when we are trying to apply the law, it's not my judgment, is it? And I have to stress this point to people, and I can't stress this enough. It is not our place to judge. Not as a Christian, not as a parent, not as a pastor. I had a very long conversation with someone once who I felt had this mistaken, who told me that it was their job, this person happened to be a pastor, to judge people. And me, who hates arguments and who doesn't like to get into confrontations or conflict, yelled at them. No. I had to stop them in their tracks. Because I maintain that it is never our job to judge anyone. Because if it was, then it would be us applying our own judgment. And all of us, pastors, fellow Christians, anyone, are fellow sinners just as much under judgment as the person we're speaking to. The words under judgment, you know, are the literal translation of the word hypocrite. Someone else who is under judgment. The phrase I use that my big sister said to me is that no one has ever been judged into the kingdom of God by human beings. This is important. We All they will hear is that we think we're better than them. And that's where Christians get the accusation sometimes of being close-minded, of being arrogant, of being holier than thou. What we are called to do 
not to judge people ourselves. What we are called to do, and again, we've got these writers on there, only when we do it gently, and only that we're certain that we're doing it out of love, is that we are called sometimes, often, to apply the judgments of God found in His Word. You might think that's only a really small difference, but it's not. The difference between the judgments seem to be coming from me and coming from God in His Word, are, it's a huge difference. And be careful that these judgments are on sin, not on the person caught in that sin. Why is this important? Because God might work through what I say, sometimes, maybe. Often I find God works in spite of me rather than through me. But I can't be sure of that in every situation. What we can be sure of, and this is another thing that we have seen in studying the Word, is that God's Holy Spirit does work. We know that the Spirit works through His Word. It is what we call a means of grace. If someone doesn't like being convicted of sin, and this sin's just my judgment, then they have a right, a right to be angry with me. But when we are applying the words of God, and people really struggle, as they will, with being convicted of sin, if they do try to take it out on us, we can say, hey, this isn't my opinion, you may need to take that up with the author. And I've said that to people, it's maybe not in so many words. But don't be upset with me, this is what God says. I believe too many people in the history of the church have convicted others of sin so that they can feel good about themselves. Or have tried to point out other people's sin so that they can feel like they're better. Forgetting, of course, that they are just as much under judgment as the one they're judging. And of course, if we ever feel we are called to apply the law of God into someone's life, we have to remember why. Because we have to remember what the law does. It doesn't work. Remember what I said at the beginning? On its own. It's part of a process. We need to remember that, yes, the law of God points to the fact that we are sinful. And so when people say, I've lived a good life, I don't need to worry about any of that stuff. We need to maybe gently take them to Romans. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But we don't do this to make them feel bad about themselves. That's not the point. The law drives us to know that we are sinful and acknowledge then our need for a saviour. The law points us to the gospel. The good news that, hey, you need a saviour? Well, I've got some good news for you. We have one of them. The law, for me, prepares the soil. It ploughs the field, it's ready for that seed to be planted and grow. Judgment without salvation, law without gospel is just cruel. It is despair without hope and it often is spiritual one-upmanship. And that's exactly what Jesus railed against in his arguments with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. You heap these heavy laws on people and they would show how, that, how much better they were Sometimes opening your mind to the need for a saviour is radical surgery. It can be a painful process. And people say to me, you Lutherans are so depressing. Look at your confession of sins that we had. You know, we used to say, I, a poor, miserable sinner. But we've talked about all the times we've fallen short and we need God's help and we're hopeless on our own. But that's what James calls looking at yourself soberly, understanding where you are before God. That is how the law drives us to realise how much we need the good news of the gospel. Because without that, also, people could hear the Easter story as a really cool history lesson. Or worse, as mythology. They go, that's a nice story, but it has nothing to do with me. When we are convicted of our own sin, all of a sudden this goes from some theoretical thing to, I need a saviour, this is a saviour. Jesus, you know, we greeted each other on Easter Sunday with the words, Christ is risen, and the answer, he is risen indeed. We need to think about two words on the end of that, Christ is risen for me. 
He's risen indeed for me, for you. And thank God that he is risen because, not because it's just a nice fact in a book, but thank God that Jesus is risen because I need him and you need him. Thank God that he has defeated death for you, for me, brought life for me. When our minds are open to this, to use a very small part of a quote from Luther, the very doors of heaven are flung open for us also. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus, our risen Lord. Amen. Now we're going to sing the song, O Praise the Name. of guests that I mentioned that are with us because of the birthday parties and stuff we have. There's one or two places where I'll need to make some announcements. And this is the first. If you've been hanging on there, dying, waiting to put your offering in the plate, we don't pass the offering plate around in our services. It's just something that we've got used to since COVID. Um, but we have it in the door on the way in. And if you've missed out, don't worry, you can put it in on the way out. Some of our offerings, what is, was in there in the bag before worship, will be brought up and placed on the altar. But as we know, we don't just, in our offering prayer, um, thank God, uh, present our money, God's money, back to God, but we also thank God for all the gifts He's given us and offer them back to His service. So let's do that now together as a portion of our offerings are brought forward. 
Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for giving your life on the cross to redeem us from our sin. We offer these gifts and the service of our lives as tangible signs of our thanksgiving. Amen. And now we will be led in the prayer of the church. We are God's children, so let us come to him in prayer in the name of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for the church that it may proclaim the good news of our Lord's death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins to all nations. Open our minds to your word so that we may be good witnesses of our risen Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide all Christian parents to bring up their children in the faith. Thank you for the schools of our church and our Sunday schools and the teachers who bring the good news of salvation to young people. Open up the minds of our children to your loving word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are searching for meaning and purpose. Bring them to hear and understand the scriptures and so to learn from Jesus himself the riches you have for them. Open up minds to seek the truth and help us continue in faithful worship and study, prayer and praise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Move us to see the wounded and hurt people in our world and to help where we can. Bring peace and harmony to countries in need of stability and good government. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Have mercy on those who are physically disabled or otherwise debilitated, Lord, and bless those who help them. Open up hearts and minds to see the needs of others and extend compassion and care in our community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Watch over our brothers and sisters who are sick or injured. Bring them to good health and give them firm confidence in your never failing love and meet the needs of all we know personally to be in want and whom we now name silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, you have made us your children through baptism and the Holy Spirit. Open your word to us so that we may witness to your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, for he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Our risen Lord Jesus invites us to come and receive his body and blood shed on the cross. We come to claim the new life that Christ has won for us. Come to this meal for the forgiveness of sins, for life and salvation. We come trusting that through this means of grace, the Spirit gives us faith, makes us right with God our Father and gives us eternal life. And let's pray together the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the supper and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. I'm going to ask our pastoral assistants and communion service to come forward as we prepare for Holy Communion. As again, as I said, because we have some guests with us, just by way of announcement, um, 
You may have noticed these tables here. We practice uh, continuous communion. We come up the side aisle, starting with the front pew. We come past and receive the bread. There is gluten-free, there are gluten-free wafers available also, so please indicate to your server if you'd like those. Uh, we have trays of individual cups on the tables. We take an individual cup from there and drink it and then place the empty cup in the bowls provided. We have grape juice in the back row, closest to this side, if anyone would prefer to have non-alcoholic grape juice. Um, or if you would like to drink from the common cup, you are able to do that as well. Or if you'd like to practice intinction, which is the dipping of the wafer into the, the cup, then obviously don't eat it when it is given to you. Uh, come forward and, and just show the server that you'd like to, to dip the wafer into the wine. So we have those three different ways of receiving the wine. Please bring children with you for a blessing also. Now, it's not a kids' own week again yet, is it? No. So the kids will not be meeting afterwards to go to kids' own. And there will be a song or two that will be played during, um, be sung during Holy Communion also, and you're invited to, to join in singing that. So that is all our announcements. Come and receive the body and blood of our Lord with this bread and wine.
before our dismissal and thanks. So I just give these uh, elements from the altar to be taken from St Mark's to Ningana Nursing Home today for people to have uh, home communion, but as part of our congregation. Thanks. Please stand for our dismissal and thanks. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his precious blood strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life eternal. Go in peace. Amen. And let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you gave your Son to die and raised him to give us eternal life. Grant that we who have received his body and blood may live in him and serve you as your children. Amen. So now go strengthened by the power of God which raised Christ Jesus from the dead and the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. As is our tradition, let's stay standing as we sing our closing song, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed.